Hello, this is Neil Conan of NPR's Talk of the Nation. Evolution and religion are often set in opposition to each other. In fact, the great majority of believers embrace evolution with no problem, and more and more scientists have come to believe that religion played an important role in evolution, that belief gave early humans a competitive advantage. These provocative ideas remain controversial. We'll have the chance to explore the evolution of religion in a discussion coming to you from WOSU at COSI. Our guests are the authors of two innovative books on the subject. In The Faith Instinct, Nicholas Wade of the New York Times examines the scientific evidence for religion's role in evolution. The book has been described as a turning point in the religion-evolution debate, and welcome to you. Also with us is Lionel Tiger, the Charles Darwin anthropologist at Rutgers University, co-author with Michael McGuire of God's Brain, which has been called the best book on the nature of religion to appear in some time. And thanks very much for you for joining us as well. And I want to begin, your books take very different approaches to the subject of religion, but begin with a common premise from which you derive interesting aspects. And that premise is that religion is virtually universal in every human society. All human groups have religion. And Lionel Tiger, what do you, what do you make of that? Well, it's a correct observation for a start. The interesting question is what one does with that observation. The first thing one can say is that all humans have these enormously skillful, complex, irritated, active brains. And just as we have to exercise our bodies, we have to do something about our brain. Because the brain is the organ of, of solving problems and creating problems. And so uh, it seemed to Michael McGuire, whom you introduced, who is a psychiatrist, uh, neuropsychiatrist at UCLA, uh, that there had to be some organic basis for religion, and that's why we called our book God's Brain, because we think the brain does God's work if you believe in God, because there's something very, uh, not quite eternal, but something very fundamental about the manner in which the brain looks around and says, well, I got to explain this somehow, and what I have in front of me, the stock pages or the sports scores, <laughs> They're not adequate, and so uh, maybe let's try God or something else. Uh, but the fact is that the universality of this impulse or this behavior uh, has uh, obviously had, as Nicholas Waite has argued, enormous importance uh, throughout our very, very long history. And Nicholas Wade, uh, you take the universality of religion and suspect that there may have been groups, human groups, who may not have believed, or may not have believed as strongly, uh, but they're not around anymore. Oh, right, I think it, religion became universal because it was of such a great advantage to the groups that had it, that all those that didn't have it, or had, had it in lesser degree, uh, perished. So religion is of obvious ad advantage to uh, small groups of hunter-gatherers, which is how we have lived for most of our existence. Uh, firstly, because it fortifies the internal fabric of society creates uh, uh, moral rules and enforces them, and also because it makes the society cohesive against external threats, even to the point that people will give up their lives in defense of their society. These are very important attributes, and this is why religion, in my view, has become embedded in our neural circuitry and uh, was present in the ancestral human population before it started to spread out from the ancestral homeland 50,000 years ago. From Africa. From Africa. And that's why all the descendant societies, both in Africa and from those that spread to the rest of the world, all, the, all those societies that we know of have religion. And the evolution was spurred, you conclude, uh, or the scientists you refer to conclude, was in large measure the product of intrahuman violence. War. Uh, 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 yes, it wasn't just war. A war helps a lot, 
um, because war sets a premium on the need for religion, but it was also in, internally, uh, religion is, is, plays a much more beneficent role. Religion is the, not just the source of our moral values, but it, it in, enforces them. And now it's very difficult, you should understand, it's, it's, it's very difficult in small groups which have no headman or chief to enforce the rules. If you set yourself up as the enforcer, you will very quickly get killed. So most um, hunter-gatherer societies that we know of that are alive today go around punishing people very carefully. They try and persuade everyone in the society that this person should be punished, and they try and get the person's own family members to kill him, because if any anyone else kills him, they will invite a revenge attack. So now you see how important it is that when religion comes in, you have a supernatural enforcer. You have an inf enforcer who will punish people for any infraction of the rules uh, and uh, without any uh, cost to, to himself. Uh, as a deity, he lives in a different world uh, and he is a kind of invisible government uh, that uh, uh, the elders of the society can rely on to in enforce their rules. Yet you do argue that altruism and warfare co-evolved. Um, yes, because they're the two sides of the same coin. Um, we, we, we are very uh, close and friendly to the in-group. We're very hostile, even genocidal, to the out-group. And this is why human nature is such a mix of contrarieties. Uh, we, we have these two different sides of our nature because those are the two attributes you needed to survive as a, in a hunter-gatherer group and still today. And let me turn to you, uh, Lionel Tiger, because your book is less about groups than more about the individual experience. Uh, one of the core questions you ask in your book is simply, why religion? And you come to an interesting conclusion about why religion is so appealing to so many human beings. Uh, my co-author, uh, Michael McGuire, was uh, the psychiatrist who first fully understood the function of serotonin, which among its other virtues created uh, Prozac and various other uh, uh, items. But basically what uh, McGuire was able to show uh, was that relationships created brain chemistry. And if you raised yourself in status or were raised in status, your serotonin increased. He did a series of dazzling experiments, which he didn't believe the results were so dramatic. Uh, but the net effect of that was to say that feeling good about things is an organic uh, brain function. And so in the book, we uh, actually try to provide a, a kind of simple, simpleton's version of the, of the story. And we talked about brain pain. I mentioned earlier that the brain is always creating problems and, <laughs> and you can stay up uh, all night and worry about something that's completely theoretical and doesn't exist, uh, but you have brain pain. And religion uh, operates to provide what we call brain soothing, which makes you feel better and uh, gives you a sense that things are okay. And we make the point just incidentally to suggest how this can work, uh, uh, that music uh, is, in, you can reliably find in religious organizations. And unless you uh, were uh, on the guest list of the Brandenburg Boys, you probably didn't hear much music, but you do in church. And the church or the mosque or the temple is beautiful and it's brain soothing. And it's furthermore, as Nicholas suggested, it's communal and you accent the bonds between people, bonds you're prepared to sing for and fight for. And so uh, somehow it seems that we have to come to grips with this phenomenon and not simply argue about whether there is a God and if, if there is what kind of God and all of that. That's, that's a very important question and, and one can only sympathize and resonate with people who ask that question. At the same time, there's a basic question which is what do we do with this phenomenal force? If I may, just uh, to talk about Nicholas's point about the leader being not on earth. The most dramatic case of this, and it's colorful and dramatic and passionate, was Napoleon's problem. When Napoleon uh, decided he wanted to be emperor, 
he offered himself a promotion. And he gathered all the crowned heads and potentates of Europe to congregate in Notre Dame in Paris, including the Pope, who must have thought that he was going to crown Napoleon. But no, Napoleon crowned himself. That did him in, as Nicholas would have predicted. <laughs> The uh, existence of hierarchy or lack of it is one of the things that uh, you, in looking at evolution, the difference between primates and humans, uh, chimpanzees, for example, have a very elaborate hierarchical structure. The early hunter-gatherer groups that you write about did not. They were much more egalitarian, fiercely egalitarian. And that has, what, what, what is it that makes that change? Uh, well, it, that's such an interesting question because it shows how our social behavior has evolved. So our, our ancestors, just when we split apart from chimps, must have had a, a chimp-like structure in their society, as you say, with a, 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 the alpha male at the top and, and the male hierarchy and the female hierarchy below it. So that's one way of ordering a society. But when you get to our hunter-gatherer hunter forebears, they're completely egalitarian. So how do you manage that transition, and how do you substitute for the authority of the leader in the chimp-style hierarchy? So I think this is where religion comes in. Religion was very necessary to provide the social cohesion uh, that our ancestors needed to survive. And then equally important in the transition from hunter-gatherer societies to more complicated societies because it provides that model of hierarchy that then becomes adopted. Right, so uh, th this is another very big social transition. When we first settle down in larger communities uh, and people have to live and get on with people who they don't know, who they're not closely related to. So you find the whole structure of human society changes and this is when you first get in archaic states, uh, you, you get leaders and, and kings and also a strong religious hierarchy of which the king usually places himself at the summit. So most Roman emperors were also pontifex maximum. The, the Queen of England is the governor of the Church of England. Uh, so the, the, the ruler uses religion to enforce their authority and it's definitely a, a, a very important part of the religion of settled societies. And, but at this point, the nature of religion has to change because in hunter-gatherer societies, religion is focused around a communal dance and there are no priests or, or hierarchical leadership. In a settled society, the first thing that the priests have to do to maintain their authority is to, is to suppress the dancing and to suppress sort of ecstatic behavior or the trances in which people used to communicate directly with the gods. Because you can't run a religion if everyone has an independent voice to the deity. The priests must monopolize it. So they make themselves the intercessors between the people and the deity. At least until you get to uh, Martin Luther uh, and things change and there is a direct relationship between uh, Protestants and God not mediated by the church hierarchy or at least not in the same way. Well, there's a prior uh, development which is what happens, and it deals directly with the period Nick is describing, when we lose the hunting-gathering coziness, though it wasn't always cozy, and we move from uh, hunting and gathering to pastoralism and agriculture. And if you look at the great current religions, they all come out of that transition. Why on earth, then, is in the Bible the statement, the Lord is my shepherd? What, what is that about? Well, it's about that transition, because suddenly you have the problem of surplus, you have the Joseph and his brothers and the granaries and all of that. And uh, the, the major religions are essentially post-hunting gathering transitional phases. They don't always work. <clears throat> and uh, we, we try to have, we've, try, we've been trying to have a, a, a kind of non-religious religion that's secular, if you will. And the best we could come up with were the two. One was utilitarianism, which has terrible costumes and no good music, <laughs> and, and communism, which is just addled and, and a, a bad analysis. And so we're still struggling with this problem uh, to have a religion that is uh, agreeable and attractive and has nice costumes and music, but doesn't 
cause us to take our head in our hands and say, this can't be right. This has to be argued differently. May I make one just very brief point about the chimps in religion? One of the things that uh, Michael McGuire, who's a primatologist uh, as well as psychiatrist, observed was that, uh, in fact, uh, chimps do have a kind of period after they've had their breakfast and uh, there are no predators around and there are no immediate enemies. They sort of hang around in a wooded area and they're just calm. The alpha male is not bossing everybody around and beating up on subdominant males, and uh, everyone is quietly grooming. The kids are playing, and then after a while, service is over, and uh, they get back to regular chimp <laughs> graininess. Uh, but there's something appealing about uh, chimpanzees and other primates because they have a kind of piece of mind, if we can use that expression, which we found very we find very attractive, and they find attractive. So I, I, the chimp-human dichotomy may not be quite as drastic as, as it seems, because chimps like to hang around too. <laughs> they, they like to hang around. I, I'm, I'm wondering, Nicholas Wade, who have you irritated more, uh, the atheists for arguing that uh, religion uh, plays an evolutionary role in creating who we are, or the uh, uh, evangelicals who, uh, for arguing uh, that uh, uh, religion is part of evolution? Well, you know, I, if I could answer the, the question indirectly, I, I went through a rather uh, surprising um, uh, process in writing this book. Um, ha having not paid a lot of attention to religion for much of my life, I, I found in writing this book that I was persuaded of its its extreme importance and significance. And I came to think that religion uh, was, a very, was a very good thing on balance, uh, and that many of the sort of bad things attributed to it, in fact, spring from other aspects of society. When societies go to war, it's for other reasons, but religion sort of comes in sideways. So uh, having decided that there were great benefits in religion, uh, I then sort of asked myself, well, how does this affect either believers or atheists? And the conclusion I came to, which I stated at the beginning of my book, is that, is that to show that, evil, that religion has an evolutionary basis does not really conflict with the central position of either side, of either the atheists or believers. Now, if you're a believer, as long as you accept the theory of evolution, um, which most believers do, then you accept that the, the, the deity through evolution has shaped the human body. So I don't see that it's a big extra step to accept the deity has also sort of shaped the human mind to believe in him. Um, it, it's not a, it shouldn't be a threat to the believer's position. Um, I think it's a little more of a threat for atheists because it's saying that, um, you know, all this, that, that all essential human behaviors are embedded in the human uh, brain and human behavior, and religion is one of them. However, it doesn't say that the deity must e exist. It just says this is, this is why religious behavior exists. So I, I said in my preface that I hoped that both believers and atheists would find things they liked in the book. So they answered my questions, and I hope I didn't irritate either of them. You can hope. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to put the same question to you, uh, uh, Lionel Tiger, because there are things that uh, both ideologies are going to find difficult to accept in, in your book, too. Yes, uh, but then uh, that's life. The, um, <laughs> I think religion gets a pass. You can walk along the street with a, a boulder on your head and say that you're doing it for religious reasons, and unless it's a big, heavy boulder and it might drop on somebody, chances are you'll get away with it. That very, very strange behaviors are acceptable under the guise of religion. And uh, some of them are more than strange. They're remarkable and tragic, such as uh, jihad and, and all of that kind of thing. So I think we have to be very sensitive to religion, not as a given, but as a something we've got. Uh, and we have to discipline, we have to analyze, we have to understand. And, by the way, given this country, we have to have a distinction between government and religion. And the framers of the Constitution understood something very clearly because they had all come from 
places where religion became a, an excellent reason for bopping somebody on the head. That's not a, a way to run a town. And so they created a, a, a remarkable document. So uh, my sense, uh, you ask me personally, I grew up in Montreal, uh, a city with more churches per capita than any city in North America. And also, by the way, the, at what time I lived there, the highest ratio of people who rented rather than owned houses, there was some relationship. But the fact was that, that religion was, was tough. And I grew up as a Jewish kid in, uh, in, in that, that town. And I, I'd get beat up just because of who I was. No reason. I was uh, widely accused of killing Christ, uh, a feat of uh, military excellence I claimed uh, not one bit of, uh, but I still got beat up. And so I have a, a visceral uh, suspicion of active religionists. At the same time, like Nicholas, you look at what goes on in religious organizations, and you look at what goes on in non-religious organizations. For example, some of the early communist societies were, were quite awful because they assumed that what you saw was what you get and there was no give in the system. So uh, I, basically, I, w I was surprised at how little response there was because I think if you put an argument sensitively, and I claim to be sensitive, forgive me, uh, uh, in a manner which allows a reader openness and a sense of not being bombarded with a noise, but rather with reflection and questions, then you're left alone, which is fine. There should be freedom of religion. There should be freedom to discuss religion. And uh, I think both of us have profited from being in this community. If we'd been in some other places, you wouldn't be working at the primary newspaper in town, and I wouldn't have a job at a university. Let me ask about how religion functions to resolve apparent contradictions. Um, prayer is offered for the health of a loved one. If the loved one recovers, then clearly prayer was the agency of, uh, of, of salvation. If the loved one dies, somehow it has been not God's fault. If a society is beneficial to its people and there is peace and happiness, that's wonderful, yet that same society can then turn around and conduct pogroms. You know, I, I, many years ago, I wrote a book called Optimism, The Biology of Hope. I think, and be, I was beginning then to formulate the idea that if you've got a big brain, you've got to do something with it. You can't just let it run, run riot. And so we're all optimistic. Uh, every sports team in every league, <laughs> every fall, believes it's going to be the champion. Ridiculous surmise. It's statistically impossible. Hey, the and 69 Mets. Uh, <laughs> this, this man shouldn't be allowed out in public. Uh, <laughs> but in, in any case, uh, the, the fact is that we have not a gene for optimism, a need for it. Because uh, we, George Bernard Shaw said it best when he described reproduction in non-Darwinian terms, but rather more enchantingly, when he said that love consists in overestimating the difference between one woman and another. <laughs> now, you can use any sexual combination you wish, but if you don't make that overestimate, if you don't think that Susie is really the most superior organism on Earth, are you going to prepare to spend your life and times and resources and affection with Susie as opposed to uh, Aletheia? No, you need that optimistic essence. And uh, religion uh, captivates because it uses that, it captures it. And so you pray for the person, that makes you feel good. The person dies, you pray for their salvation. That makes you feel good. What a system. <laughs> <laughs> a feedback loop, in other words. Well, the idea I had, forgive me for seeming like a, uh, a child, maybe I am, but my image of what religions do is that, uh, like that toy, I, I actually owned when I was a kid, of a bird with a big beak at the edge of a, of a glass of water, and it w would go down and touch the water and then come back up, and there was some gravitational trick that did it. And I think religions work that way that uh, things go along and you dip down, get a bit of water, and they come popping back up, and you carry on. And uh, that's why it's a, it's a cycle. That's why we have the, 
the holidays, and and we. We have, uh, I remember when I was, a, a, for a very short while, I was an earnest religious kid, and I read the documents, and I was told that if you got a new sweater, there was a certain prayer for it. Well, I got a new sweater, and I looked up the prayer, and I said the prayer. The sweater was as shabby as any other sweater I ever had, <laughs> but I felt good because I was a member now of a large, larger community. I just become bar mitzvahed, and I thought I, there would be major changes in my life. I'm afraid there weren't. But that's, that's another matter. Um, Nicholas Wade, um, as uh, Lionel Tiger suggests, uh, uh, religion, praying, ritual, the bonding, all feels good. Uh, uh, food uh, satisfies us in important ways. Sex also feels good. Evolution provides those feelings for a reason, because all of those things then contribute to the group survival. Right. Um, and the, the drives that are necessary for our survival are placed in our, in our heads. Now, for food and sex, they are placed sort of quite well below the level of consciousness, because those are very ancient drives. Religion is a very recent appearance on the evolutionary scene. So the drive for evolution is placed at a much higher level in our brain and in sort of quite sophisticated ways, like the need for, for prayer. In terms of the contrarieties you were, were mentioning earlier, I don't think one should un understand religion to be a, a sort of a cognitive structure. It's not like science. You can't demand logical consistency. It, it's a way of, it's to do with em emotions. It's a way of getting everyone on the same page emotionally. So you're bonded to them because you share certain uh, beliefs in, and, uh, and that's, how, that's what it's meant to do, to create emotional cohesion. So it doesn't really matter if you pray for rain and it does or it doesn't come. That's a little beside the point. Yet, uh, I'm sorry, well, you, you, And you, you can't excuse yourself from the group on the grounds of your own importance and, and wonderfulness. So if you in this country were to stand up for any political office and say, I don't believe in God, no chance, no chance. And the reason is, like Napoleon, you don't want somebody that thinks that they're better than anybody else and are not subject to th the higher majesty, if you will, of life in all its complexity. Not humble before God. Exactly. Um, but I wanted to get back to what you were saying, Nicholas Wade, that uh, what you're positing requires, uh, most people think evolution functions on the in, in the individual. It gives an individual a better chance of survival, gives an individual a better chance of uh, scattering their seeds and uh, making more children, which as you say in the book is the only uh, scale on which evolution tests anything. Your theory posits that evolution happens to groups as well, which has some interesting uh, aspects to it. Well, that's right, because when you think of it, we don't survive as individuals, we survive as groups. Uh, and, and that is, so our social behavior, just like an ant in an ant colony is uh, attuned to behave the way its group re requires, we too are attuned, though in very much more sophisticated ways, to behave in the way our groups require to survive. Now the reason that this isn't commonplace, I think, is historical, and it's basically that, that sociologists have have kicked evolution out of their kit for explaining things, which seems to me a terrible mistake, because humans belong on the tree of evolution just as firmly as does any other organism. So we have totally neglected the genetic roots of our social behavior, but they must surely be there. And these transitions which we described earlier between one very different kind of human society and another must also impress themselves on our genome, because the whole purpose of the genome is to adapt to its surroundings. So what our genome adapts to, to a very large extent, is not just the physical environment, it's the social environment that we create for ourselves. To, to, to follow uh, Nicholas's point about the social sciences, do you know, have you heard, that in many universities, possibly even this one, there are two entities called natural sciences and social sciences. <laughs> and the assumption somehow is that social behavior is not natural. This is ridiculous. This is completely ridiculous. And all of us in the trade have labored for, uh, it seems, centuries 
uh, with students who think that they just emerged from from somewhere, that there was no history to them, to their families, to their lives. I remember being asked by, in effect, the Wall Street Journal if I would write a, an op-ed piece about the last uh, episode of the first year of Survivor. You may remember that, that yes. I think. And I, I watched the program. I must say it was a, a burden. Uh, and and, I, <laughs> and I, I wrote an editorial, and I said, this is completely ridiculous. No single person can survive alone. It's always a group phenomenon. And uh, the program is misconceived. It was articulated for stupid theatrical reasons to the great benefit of the owner of the program. Uh, but it was intellectually wrong. And that only could come in a community where there were two different kinds of science, social and natural. And uh, we still have this all the time, all the time. And it's, it's unnecessary, and it's just sad. In fact, you argue in your book that uh, you, you said earlier religion gets a pass. You said we don't really even study religion that much because we take it for granted. Of course, it does all this stuff for us. Well, it's, it's, it's a given. There are national, uh, national uh, reasons for it. Every society has its own sort of religious kind of thing. Uh, but uh, we, we don't know very much about it. Nicholas, in his book, has a, uh, a, a dazzling discussion about Muhammad and whether Muhammad actually existed. And, uh, and uh, evidently, there wasn't much response to that. And my s thought was that most people don't read. Uh, they look at cartoons, maybe, but not, uh, <laughs> not read. But that's a, that's a, uh, a very important uh, aperçu. And uh, people would prefer not to think about it. Uh, we're going to take questions from the audience in a few minutes, so if you've uh, been listening to the conversation and there's something you'd like to ask about, uh, there's a microphone in the back. Just uh, put your thoughts together and uh, stand up behind the microphone and line up there, and we'll uh, call on you in turn and, and take some questions. Just tell us your name and put your question out, and we'll do our best to uh, uh, direct it uh, as best we can. Uh, but I wanted to ask a, a couple more questions first. And one of them is an observation, Lionel, in your book, that as oxygen is to air, guilt is to religion. You know, I'm, I'm here under somewhat false pretenses. I was told that this was basically for students, 55% of which did not believe in evolution. And I was trying to think of a c kind of way of making students aware that they simply can't abide that kind of lack of knowledge. And my, my uh, uh, example was going to be, did God create the orgasm? <laughs> and if so, why and how? And that raises the entire issue of guilt, of course, because uh, sexual control, as again, Nicholas has pointed out very carefully, is central to religious activity. And uh, the uh, uh, guilt is a very uh, strange phenomenon, but clearly it has to do with being willing to be a member of the group and not an outlaw. Uh, some people are smart enough to not feel guilt, but not be outlaws. For example, Max Weber, the German sociologist who wrote three of the best books on the sociology of religion, described himself as religiously unmusical. And I think some people are that way. They, they, they don't hear the music, but they don't want to fight about it. And uh, in Weber's terms, he did brilliant scholarship on what he wasn't musical about. Uh, but guilt is, um, it, it's unfortunate that it becomes the currency of the realm in certain circles. And I must say, uh, reading the daily newspaper uh, about the politics often here, it makes me feel guilty that I pay taxes to hear some of these people talking about how everyone should feel guilty all the time because they're not doing something in just the right way. Well, give us a break. Guilt, though, is the enforcement mechanism. Uh, y yes, and uh, I, I think Nicholas will say that for many cases it works. <laughs> Excuse me. Is there all the, if you look at all these um, very, very social behaviors, we have. I mean, guilt is one. Uh, blushing is another. You know, how can blushing be good for the individual to denounce you've just told a whopping lie? But it's good for the society to know who's blushing. Or, or the whites of our eyes are very interesting. You can tell where someone is looking by the whites of their eyes. But all other primates have very small whites of their eyes. 
And so they don't give away where they're looking. So it's of, a, of great disadvantage to you, especially in battle, if you're going to th throw a weapon at someone, for, for, for the opponent to, to see the whites of your eyes. So that must have some big compensating advantage. And it's because we're such a social species that it helps a lot to see where someone is looking. Um, which uh, <coughs> I wanted to ask you about something you wrote in your book as well, and this is uh, towards the end. The three monotheisms seem long ago to have reached the limits of their development, lagging behind the increasing complexity of human societies and a vast growth of organized knowledge. Many people no longer develop their innate propensity for religious behavior, leaving unfulfilled a substantial component of human nature. Is this their fault or society's fault or perhaps the fault of the unchanging religions on offer? Well, I think, I think many people do have a, a desire to believe. And uh, the age when people sort of commit themselves to religion is the age of puberty when they are confirmed or bar mitzvahed. Uh, and if they commit themselves to religion, then, then they are religious through the rest of their life, usually. And they're, they're fulfilled in, in, in religious terms. For, for people who reject religion at that stage uh, on cognitive grounds or for no other reason, I think many of them sort of go through life feeling something's uh, missing and looking for all alternatives. And, and what this reflects, I think, is that, that the desire to believe in a, in, a, in a religion and be part of a religious community is, is wired into our psyches. Does that suggest that those of us who don't feel that way have some sort of genetic defect? No, it's not a genetic defect. We still have the genetic circuitry. Uh, it's just that we're not fulfilling the promptings that that circuitry uh, makes. And, and the, the three monotheisms, uh, although religions do, of course, uh, change a little, they can't change overnight because that would uh, uh, seem to betray the sort of founding documents on which a religion is founded. So religions have rather have somewhat limited opportunity for, for change. And I think the, the architects of religions should be perhaps more aware of how they need to sort of up, update themselves to remain well. Well, I think they are aware, and they do try and, and do that. Um, but but it, it does seem to me that religion is, uh, is, is, is failing to capture increasing numbers of people. The church attendance, certainly in Europe, has gone down very low. Uh, uh, but we still remain a religious, a much more religious country for various interesting reasons we can go into later. The um, updating of religion, difficult when uh, you're updating received wisdom. You see, this is where, where Nicholas is correct, that, that the people who are trying to update religion are just not good at it. They're usually ignorant of human nature. They're ignorant about human history, about the human species. They substitute belief for questions. And as a consequence, they're bound to get it wrong. And that's the problem for their industry, if you will. Hmm. And you can see it in, in churches in Italy, for example. I had a friend who was an architect, and somebody was talking about all the churches in the centers of towns in Italy, who, the, who churches which were not used. What could be done with them? And he said, it's obvious they're in the center of town, car washes, uh, because uh, that's an adaptive use that would work. Well, that was a kind of brilliant idea, and of course came to nothing. But the fact is that um, certainty and belief uh, are not necessarily antithetical to proud group membership. I'm somebody that doesn't believe in religion. It may have become obvious to a few people here. At the same time, I can easily cry at a life insurance commercial uh, <laughs> because these are real human emotions that the insurers and the advertising people are grappling with and reflecting back to us. And uh, we know they're right, that you, you do need somebody to take care of you. Could be John Hancock. It could also be a church. And in fact, I think that uh, churches are still the principal provider of daycare in this country. At that point, we're going to turn to questions from the audience. And uh, again, just come up to the microphone and tell us who you are. And go ahead. Hi, my name is Robert Wagner. Um, when Darwin wrote Origin of the Species, microbiology wasn't even a science yet. We didn't even know about it. Um, and if you take a look back at the, the development of the Earth, 
life, complex life popped up within about 700,000 years. And now when we take a look at a DNA molecule, that's an extremely complex molecule to have been formed in such a short period of time. Do you have any comments on uh, maybe the theory on the primordial broth? Has microbiology changed that theory at all? Or is that still pretty much a valid theory? Well, uh, Darwin's theory that life began in a warm little pond is uh, uh, still one of uh, several uh, uh, theories about the origin of life. I mean, you're right that the, the time for life to have developed on Earth does seem rather short. Um, th there was something called the last heavy bombardment. That was the final rain of enormous meteorites as the Earth was forming. So that was um, about 3.9 billion years ago. And yet, they're the earliest signs of life in Greenland rocks at about 3.8 billion years ago. So life seems to have sprung up on Earth at almost the earliest possible minute that it, it could. And it certainly is a challenge for uh, biologists to uh, explain uh, the chemical evolution of life on Earth. And they certainly have not provided a, f a fully satisfying one at, at present. So the, you know, the question is still, uh, open. Next. Okay, my name is Joe Rutter, and uh, my question has to do with abstinence. Uh, so many religions, if their agents of evolution uh, promote abstinence from sex, uh, from food, and those seem kind of counterintuitive. Why is that a common practice in so many religions of uh, monasticism, of of deep uh, withdrawal from the world if religion helps us evolve. Lionel Targa, I know you write about this in your book. Uh, well, the best uh, <clears throat> exposition of this is James Joyce's The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, in which his, his fierce conflict between religion and sex is dealt with as only a, a writer of that stature could do. Uh, it's easy. A sex, for example, which is probably the thing most difficult to control because it's tempestuous and it's at the core of, of evolution after all, uh, that has to be controlled. It can't be just generalized because it's too random a, a, a method of uniting two people who will create a third person. And so, yes, w making it a source of guilt is one way, but there are other ways of dealing with abstinence. Uh, love, for example, you, you love the idea that you're going to be a responsible member of your community and you therefore don't do or do do whatever it is is appropriate. Uh, but it's certainly the case that the thou shalt not tribe is much more uh, common than the thou shalt tribe. And the thou shalts usually have to do with things like saying a prayer before you wear a sweater for the first time. It's not that interesting. <clears throat> so uh, it, it's a very important question. And uh, remember also that most religions emerged in scarcity. We've, ha we've not had the problem of obesity that we have now. We've had the problem of starvation. And so somebody had to say, no, 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 enough, enough, abstain, please. And uh, if it's the priest, fine. If it's the bureaucrat, OK. If it's a nutritionist, fine. But we're in a very different situation now than we were when we were in that hunting gathering community where life was really uh, tricky. And if you wanted dinner, you had to run for your dinner, not run after dinner as we now have to do. Did you want to? Can, can I give a brief answer, which is complimentary to Lionel's, because this is a very, a, a very important question. <clears throat> you see, the purpose of religion is to solve immensely difficult, significant problems. Nothing is more important to a society than its rate of growth. So, it, if if you if there are other groups around you and you don't grow fast enough, simply in terms of numbers, you will be overwhelmed. And if you're if you're living in a place where you out eat your resources you will starve to death. So you must have some way of regulating your numbers. Now, how can you go around, especially in a primitive society or even a primitive state, and tell people how many children they can have? You can't. But religion can. 
So all religions are full of very precise, interesting instructions that have a direct effect on the rate of demographic growth. So you can ratchet up the up demographic growth by encouraging women to marry early and have as many children as possible. You can ratchet down by sending people to monasteries or nunneries. So now you see the logic behind all these customs that if you consider them in isolation seem terribly weird, but if you consider them as being part of a solution to a central human problem, they make a lot of sense. Next. Um, my name is Emily Shaw, and my question is specifically for um, Nicholas Wade. Um, I wasn't sure how you moved from religion as a replacement in hierarchy in egalitarian societies to the use of religion by heads of state and um, monarchies and other forms of government like that. Um, is the question how, how you make the transition in terms of a religious structure? Yes. Um, well, it, it's, you see religion is always, is always adapted by a society to its particular needs. Although there may be a, a lag, nonetheless it's, it's negotiated by the leaders of the society with the supernatural. And the supernatural beings then sort of send down the same uh, message. So as so society's needs changed, the nature of religion is changed by the people who create it. So it's a, a living thing created by the leaders of a society to make everyone behave in the way they judge best for society's survival. So with that general principle, I think you can see it's no surprise that the form that religion takes changes as human society in adapting to other reasons to its environment, becoming agricultural, say, or a modern urban civilization, how religion will be changed accordingly. So religion plays a role in, for example, convincing people to do the difficult work of irrigation in early agricultural societies? Y yes, because think how foreign to a hunter and gatherer sort of hard agricultural labor or digging canals would be. How do you make people do things that are so alien to their nature? Um, so religion is, an, is a, an essential way of getting everyone on the same page, planting and sowing at the same time, and, and working for the benefit of the community. The, and the essential trick, it's not a trick, the essential accomplishment of religion is to make us subordinate our own very selfish natures to the needs of society. It's a very difficult stratagem to pull off, but completely essential for the survival of human societies. Next. Hi, uh, my name's Sue Goodwin. And um, I've been observing that the practice of mindfulness is becoming increasingly popularized. Um, it's being discussed a lot in how we prepare troops uh, to go overseas. There's going to be a major motion picture about it. And as a way to derive meaning from the world, as a way to locate oneself in the world and deal with the difficulties of being human, without perhaps some of the pitfalls of religiosity. Are you seeing the same thing, and do you think mindfulness has that possibility? Sorry, did you use the word mindfulness? Mindfulness, right. I don't understand that word in the way you're using it. Well, it's, <coughs> it's very much coming out of the Buddhist tradition of being able to step outside of yourself and observe your emotions, being aware of, being able to sort of separate emotion from thought and being more aware of your surrounding and in a more intentional way acquire meaning as opposed to just receiving meaning. I, I would um, put that in the category of, of the personal side of religion. Um, so the religion, religion has to be attractive on a personal basis for people to practice it. And, and and it's the social side of religion that is sort of seen by natural selection, as it were. So I think mindfulness is, is definitely a part of the personal um, side of religion. We'll take one more question from the microphone, and then I'm afraid we're going to have to call it a night. Okay, I feel very lucky. My name is Nareet Parker. Um, the first is a quick comment. Just in the beginning of the Old Testament, it says, Bereshit bara Elohim, and it's in, in the beginning God created, but Rosh also means head. So it's also 
can be read in two ways, which is in the mind God created, so that the preface of the whole book is, this is a story, but it's our story, and it's an organizing principle. So I guess that's my question, is to my view, um, Open interpretation, open ignorance, if you will. Lionel, you said, you know, answering every question with another question is central to the survival and the furtherance of a, a group of people, of humanity. How do you view even some more recent religious sects that take the opposite tack when it comes to science and the furtherance of human knowledge, uh, stem cell research, refusing medical treatment, um, that seems completely in conflict with, with living and prospering and, and growing and furthering the human conversation. I, I think there's, there's a historical reason for that, and it goes back, I suppose, to the, to the Reformation when the Protestants uh, decided that God should be interpreted directly from the Bible, whereas the Catholics held, perhaps more wisely, that a God should be understood through what the priests said. So when the Bible, when the actual text of the Bible started to be reconstructed by the great German scholars of the 19th century, of, of Elhas and, and others, uh, the basis of Protestantism somewhat uh, fell apart, because here we learn that the Bible was not you know, a single divinely inspired work of, of God, you could see all the different hands that had cobbled it together. So Protestantism then had to make a very difficult choice. Did it join the, the Jews and the Catholics who by and large had said, well, our religion is what our priests uh, or rabbis say it is, or do we uh, just stick our heels, dig our heels in and say, no, the, the text of the Bible is inerrant and uh, everything, every word is true. Well, un most Protestants chose to go with the interpretation side, but, but the fundamentalists um, were left with the position that they would defend every word of the Bible as being the inerrant um, truth. And, and this is partly from the source that uh, people d uh, dispute the theory of evolution and, uh, and that it's why the um, dislike use of stem cells. So I just think it's an unfortunate choice that religions have uh, put themselves in opposition to the theory of evolution. There's no necessary contradiction between religion and science as explanations of the world, but they are orthogonal explanations. They don't necessarily intersect. Uh, Lionel, I just wanted to bring you back to one of the central points of your book, though, which is that every religion is, in a sense, a story. I'm told by friends of mine who are literary agents that they go crazy because all the publishers want what's called a narrative arc. <laughs> and if you don't put in a, a book about traffic lights that has a narrative arc, it won't get published. Uh, yes, they're, they're, but we're storytellers and we're story listeners. And uh, they're glorious, interesting stories. Now, when you look at how they got written and what the various components of, of these stories are, you appreciate uh, the profound value of human variety. The, uh, the fact is, we, we're two guys who live in the same city. We wrote, us, we wrote books on roughly the same subject, completely different books. And that's not because we're ornery or inclined to dislike what we do or we, we, each other. People are different, and uh, co cohesive groups called religions are different. But let me conclude, since I gather this, you're trying to get us out of here, that one of the um, things that made me aware of both the power of the military connection between males and religion was when I was in France writing, preparing to write my book on optimism. I had a trip through a uh, cave in the south of France, uh, which was six miles long. And uh, I went with the owner of it uh, because I, I got to meet him. And we went in a little railroad, and there were electric lights and everything else. It was, and it still took a long time to get to the chapel, as it was called. This was a, a room, rock, just a rock that looked like a chapel. And evidently, people came there, and with forefingers and red paint, they made their mark. And it must have been an initiation ceremony for the young guys. And uh, I dare say there were a lot of them didn't make it there and didn't make it back. 
but those that did left their mark and probably fought like hell for that group. And at that point, you realize that strange as it may be, bizarre and uh, terrifying almost, there's something to this connection between male commitment to the group and the idea that the group is super valuable and it's something about which you really don't ask questions. Now, your point is that if you want to learn something about stem cells, ask that question, please. And if you don't want me to ask it, don't stop me from doing my work because I'll save your child one day when we find a cure for some ghastly disease. So I think we've got in this community to grow up about this fundamentalist versus what? Fundamentalist versus what? Trivia? Air? What? Thank you both very much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Our thanks to Lionel Tiger, co-author of God's Brain, and to Nicholas Wade, author of The Faith Instinct, for joining us to discuss the evolution of religion. I'm Neil Conan. Good evening.